Hi everyone, my name is Dr Matt Williams. I'm a tutor in politics here at the University of Oxford. I am also what's known as the Access Fellow of Jesus College, which is one of the 39 colleges that makes up the University of Oxford. Now today I'm going to give you a sample lecture on why Superman wears underpants over leggings. The reason for this lecture topic is because I have a very childish mind. I'm constantly asking childlike questions about the world. You know, the sort of things that you would have asked, or we all asked when we were about four years old, such as why is the sky blue? and why is gold yellow when other metals are silver, stuff like that. I just never grew out of that. And to be honest, I teach my students in Oxford to think like children all over again. So I asked myself quite a childish question about why Superman is dressed the way he is. And to be honest, as with all of these seemingly immature childlike questions, it sent me down a rabbit hole of such wonder and exploration that has links to do with the aesthetics of comics, the philosophy of the superhero genre in literature, and the economics of, fan, of superhero fiction, all sorts of things. So this is a really fascinating subject. I hope you find it interesting as well. And let's dive into it. Okay, so let's start in the beginning and look at the origins of Superman. So this is the first time that Superman was ever seen in print in action comics number one in 1938. So you've got to take yourself back to that first time of seeing this. So this would have been on newsstands in the 1930s. No one had ever been seen the Superman character prior to this. So imagine how you might feel if you were back in those days seeing this comic and what your instant reactions would be looking at this image. Because there's a lot going on in this image. It's really fascinating. There's lots of details. There's a man who seemingly lifting an entire car. He's obviously traveling at quite a pace uh, because he's got a cape flying behind him, flapping in the, in the breeze. He seems to have dashed it against some rocks. There are some very scared people running in the opposite direction, running in all directions to get away from him. So, and the word action is in huge letters above him. So <laughs> this is a really fascinating scene, perhaps most striking of all, and the thing that I still couldn't really get over whenever I think about Superman is he's wearing pants over tight leggings, which is super weird, right? You know, I mean, now because we're so familiar with the Superman character, we might not, you know, look, look twice. We might sort of think, well, that's obvious that, you know, a comic book hero would have this sort of outfit. But surely at the time, it must have been a bit arresting, to say the least. Now, the reason for showing this image is that this is a historical artefact. This is a hugely important contribution to world pop culture, and it deserves enormous respect. And what we might do in, a, say, an interview at the University of Oxford is ask someone to look at an image and to analyse it. So, if you'd like, I pause the video and just look at this image and ask as many questions about it as you can. Unlock that sort of toddler mindset of why would they have done this? Why wouldn't they have done the other? You know, really try and get into the weeds and try and think about why you address your superhero in such an eccentric fashion. What would be the purpose for that? Well, let's get into the, to some of the visuals. I mean, there's definitely a sort of superhero aesthetic that is quite consistent. You can tell if someone goes to, say, a Halloween party and is dressed as a superhero. They don't really need to dress as a specific superhero for you to probably tell, provided they have certain attributes, provided they're wearing a relatively sort of figure-hugging costume, usually in quite bright, con high contrast colours, perhaps with some sort of utility belt or some sort of tool like a trident, uh, perhaps with some sort of logo. You know, there are a few elements of the whole package that are consistent. And perhaps one of the most striking and consistent is the cape. Now why was Superman wearing a cape? Well in the initial action comic he actually couldn't fly. He could just run very fast. The cape was more to make it seem like he was more animated because of course a comic book is not it's not a, a dynamic medium. It's it's completely sort of inert. And so in order to give a sense of movement the cape was essential. So the cape wasn't actually designating his capacity to fly in the first ever action comics. The, his ability to fly and shoot lasers from his eyes, that all came actually later in the character's journey. But in the initial iteration, the cape was merely there to, as a visual cue to let to readers that there was some sort of movement going on. What else can we see from this image? Well, there's lots of very bold colours, and Superman himself is wearing all of the primary colours. Now this is in part just so that he's so striking, so that people looking at newsstands will be arrested 
uh, metaphorically speaking, and think, oh, right, I want to have a look at this comic. It's also partly because of the limitations of the medium at that time, that the range of inks that were available to printers was, was fewer than there are now. And so the sort of colours you could use were actually quite limited. So if you wanted to be visually striking and also utilise the, the, the available resources, then you kind of had to use the primary colours. Okay. What else is going on here? I mean, really get into the weeds of it. Superman is facing, is heading towards the right of the image and the, I guess, villain, or villain, although we're not quite sure yet, is sort of crawling on their knees in the opposite direction. Now that distinction between heading towards the right of an image and heading towards the left is very significant subconsciously, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But let's deal with the primary question of this lecture, which is why is Superman dressed in such a odd way. Why, does, why is he wearing underpants over leggings? Well, actually, he wasn't the, pre, the, he wasn't the first uh, character to be so dressed. You can see Flash Gordon actually predates Superman by several years, and he was dressed in a similarly uh, sort of evocative way. And Flash Gordon would have been evoking the strongmen of the early 20th centuries and the late 19th century. So this image of someone posing with rippling muscles, wearing sort of tight, almost like speedos, would have been sort of a cultural reference point at the time that people probably would have understood. So even if by 20, you know, 21st century standards we're a little bit sort of surprised at the clothing choice, <laughs> By the standards of that time, it still would have been odd. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's not as if people were wearing this regularly, but they probably would have thought, oh, okay, well, that's what strong people wear. That's, I mean, incredibly strong people. So they would have made that intellectual association. So that, basically speaking, is why Superman is wearing underpants. Why he's wearing them over leggings is perhaps a bit more of a mystery, but could be more to do with just trying to distinguish him from being just a strong man and having other attributes and being an alien, as, as we know in the character. Now, I mentioned the significance of the right and the left. Now, to anyone who reads an Indo-European language, especially those which start in the top left uh, of a page and then scroll towards the right and then go downwards, like English, they will tend to associate progression in a journey with movement towards the right, because as we read, we progress towards the right. Now, of course, people that read languages such as Arabic or Japanese or Chinese would read in the opposite direction. They would tend to read from the right-hand side of a page towards the left, so their idea of progression would be the opposite direction. But certainly in Western pop culture, we have this idea that if, if a, a character is developing their journey or is on the right path, they will be heading to the right of their screens. And we won't necessarily consciously think this, but it's it's fundamentally important, and it's simply because of the way we read. So if you think about the Super Mario games, the, the classic Nintendo game, the platformer, Mario is progressing in his journey relentlessly towards the right. If he ever goes in the opposite direction, you kind of feel like he's going back to the start, and something's gone wrong. And you see this sort of idea used in montages in films. If you ever want to have a sense of a character moving forward in their journey to some sort of goal, then you typically see them running, walking, dancing, off towards the right. If they're going the other way, it's a little bit unnerving, it's a little bit like they're going back in time. Okay, of course, you know, it, it doesn't need to mean that. This is all just how we tend to associate that idea. And you can even see this in the hairstyle. So if you notice the difference between Clark Kent uh, on the left, uh, in the top, top right corner, and Superman, their hair is parted on different sides. Clark Kent's hair is parted on the left, and Superman's is parted on the right. Now, it is said that we subliminally get a sense of being unnerved by the left parted hair. <laughs> now, I don't know how true that is, but uh, there is something about uh, uh, something being towards the left, which is culturally and psychologically associated with being less trusted. I mean, the word sinister, for example, comes from the Latin for left left-handed, because people that were left-handed were considered to be sinister. You know, left-handedness is only, is only an attribute that about 9% of the human population have, and for silly reasons, it has not been trusted by people that just didn't understand the genetics of it. But we still hold a degree of 
as I say, mistrust perhaps of things that are left oriented. And so hence the, the snivelling villain in the middle is crawling his way to the left, whereas Superman is resolutely, cape-wavingly moving to the right. <laughs> okay, so there's quite a lot going on. Uh, in this image uh, in the bottom right, you can now see Superman in a more sort of advanced form in a later version of the comic. The S logo is more clearly developed and better defined than in the first Action Comics. His name, of course, is now, is now included on the front page. And you, you get a sense of his being a strong man because he's shattering chains with nothing but his raw strength. So you get some of the attributes of the character almost immediately. And again, that image of the comic book is popping with the three primary colours of red. Uh, yellow and blue. So it's very bright, it's very garish, it's very attractive, and you get a lot of information about the character without it having to be written down. So in simple terms that explains some of the aesthetic of Superman. But what about the appeal? What is it about superheroes that is so intoxicatingly fascinating for human beings? Now. As far as I am aware, the second oldest piece of writing that we have in our possession as a species is a superhero story. And it's called The Tale of Gilgamesh, and it comes to us from the Sumerian Empire, which, is, which was founded in modern Iraq. So it was in modern Iraq, but no longer exists. It is basically the origins of human civilization. It's an incredibly important document as you can imagine because it's nearly the oldest piece of writing that we have access to. The oldest piece of writing we have access to is apparently a tax document. <laughs> so human beings uh, have taxes and then they have superheroes. Now obviously there will have been other things written down around that time and before then but it's notable that these are some of the things that have survived to us to the modern day. Now if you go from Gilgamesh, this heroic story, and you sort of walk through world culture uh, all the way up to the present day, you know, you can think of um, Achilles and Hercules and Agamemnon and Odysseus and Pericles and pff, Harry Potter and Captain America. <laughs> and, you know, I'm, I'm you know, jumping forward a bit in time, but I think the point is hopefully clear that there's been a very long fascination with heroes and not just any old hero, but heroes with extraordinary abilities, sometimes supernatural abilities, like Hercules, who is a demigod, uh, or Superman, sometimes who are just incredibly skillful, like Robin Hood or uh, Batman. So individuals that don't have supernatural powers but have exceptional capabilities and skills. Now, why are we so interested? Why is that hero genre in literature so appealing? What, what is it that we keep going back to? Well, there's a lot, right? I mean, it, and there's a, it's going to be slightly different for every person that consumes the medium. But I suppose a number of fairly clear themes are likely to be a sense of powerlessness in the audience, a sense of being quite scared. And so... Superheroes can be a, a wish fulfillment, a fantasy for individuals who feel powerless to, to get a, a bit of an escapism. Imagine if I had the abilities of Harry Potter, of Captain America. Imagine if I could do those things, then I wouldn't need to be scared so often. So it can help us resolve some of the fears in our lives. But then, you know, of course, superhero stories are much more advanced than someone with some power. It is what they do with that power which also matters. And, and superhero stories, not always, but, but not infrequently, have sort of moralising elements to them as well, that the hero uses the power in order to attain some sort of goal. Not infrequently, justice, like the, like the Justice League aim to do. So it also sort of teaches us about what is valuable in this world, what is just and what is unjust. And so we get this sort of sense of what matters in life. Now, for some, it has an even deeper existential goal. In other words, it, it helps us to understand who we are. Now, this is a picture of a man called Friedrich Nietzsche, he's a German philosopher. And he's sometimes, misleadingly, I'm afraid, credited with coining the, the term Superman. 
Now, he actually came up with the term Übermensch, which is German, and as a German word, it's sometimes loosely translated to Superman as a consequence of a George Bernard Shaw play called Man and Superman. Now, the reason it's a bit of a loose translation is because in Nietzsche's rendering of Superman, it's not an individual with any sort of special abilities at all. For Nietzsche, an Übermensch was someone who was able to reconcile themselves with envy. So, basically, Nietzsche was a, a staunch critic of Christianity. He saw Christianity as a slave ideology, as, as a, a set of ideas cooked up by slaves in the Roman Empire in order to reconcile themselves with their lack of power. And so, hence why Christianity has strong emphasis on forgiveness, of turning the other cheek, of denying your or sort of base instincts such as envy. For Nietzsche, he thought that this was somehow betraying our humanity, that we should, we should embrace our inner green-eyed monster. We should, we should work out what we are envious of and pursue it doggedly. So he would have disapproved of people turning the proverbial of the cheek, and he felt that an ubermensch was someone that just completely acknowledged everything that they wanted and basically sought to get it, someone who was single-minded of purpose. So that was the Übermensch. Incidentally, the Übermensch was also expropriated by the Nazi party in the 1930s, but the association with Nazism it, it would not have been endorsed by Nietzsche either. So Nietzsche, his, his Übermensch idea is used both for Superman and for, for Nazi white supremacism, and both are complete misreadings of Nietzsche's work. But nonetheless, that's some of the influences that he's had. And so Nietzsche was trying to deal with an existential question, which was, what does humanity do without God? Now, of course, humanity still has God or gods, it, but he noticed a trend, which was that the world, and especially the, the Western and European world, was becoming more secular. So religiosity was declining, attendance at church was declining. And he wrote a very provocative book called God is Dead and We Have Killed Him. And so he was trying to anticipate what would society do without the ideology of Christianity and without the, the support structures that that provided a lot of people, both in terms of psychological support but also existential support. In other words, giving people a sense of why they exist, why they are alive, giving them some meaning to their lives. And so he sort of suggested that... We, that one solution was to embrace your your envious sort of true humanity, that the sort of the raw, almost barbarism of your humanity. Um, other philosophers and psychologists also recognised that secularism was likely to have a big impact. And another prominent example was a man called Carl Jung. Now, for Jung, he similarly noticed that with the decline of Christianity, meant that there was a decline of of myth. Uh, and there was potentially an age of mythlessness, in other words, an age without story, without mythology. And that instead of myth and storytelling, we were going to be just inundated with raw science. And for Jung, he was concerned that science couldn't solve some of those existential questions, because the basis of the scientific method is not absolute knowledge, but is testing hypotheses and trying to sort of say what we trying to get closer to some idea of, of truth. But it's it's crucial in science never to say that you know the absolute answers to everything because that's not truly scientific. And so for people like Jung, this is likely to lead to a huge amount of anxiety amongst the population because if you've taken Christianity out of the, the equation and therefore you've taken away the stories that people told themselves as to why they exist and what makes life valuable, and in its place you've provided science, which is founded on this idea of we're not really sure and we're trying to guess and we're trying to test hypotheses. This is just going to lead to a very difficult situation where there are a lot of people that just don't know what to think half the time and are going to be absolutely scared out of their minds. And so for Jung, this, this sort of led to the inevitability of a growth in new mythologies, of a, of a changing in narrative. So people would, would replace the myths of Christianity with new myths. And he thought that that was one of the only ways to resolve neuroses in other words, people are just being terribly worried all the time as to what they are meant to be doing in this world, what their existence is all about. Now, the reason for me telling you about Nietzsche and Jung is that they might explain the explosion in the popularity of superheroes in the 20th and 21st centuries. Now, of course, related to that is the accessibility of the medium, the comic book, 
was also a new medium in the early 20th century. Literacy rates were higher, there was higher disposable income amongst uh, people that previously would have been, been unable to absorb literature. So there was a lot, there are a lot of factors that explain the rise in the superhero genre in the 20th and 21st centuries. But part of it could be because of this sense of wanting some answers and wanting to feel safe. That human beings were being detached from a lot of the things that had made them feel safe in the past, and in particular their religion. Because the religion gave everyone this sort of nice, neat story as to what they were here for and what they were going on to after death. And without some of that, there was a huge spike in anxiety and neurosis. And to try and compensate for that, there was a big demand and therefore a large market for stories about heroic individuals. Okay? Now this relates to a concept known as postmodernism. Now if modernism could be loosely described as the, the pinnacle of scientific achievements. So the modern world was built on the foundations of the Enlightenment and of science. And so the, uh, the apotheosis, the, the triumph of, science, of modernism is everything being explained by science. So every single question that we have that we want to answer could be resolved by scientific papers, by data analysis, by sort of raw tabulation of facts and figures. Okay, but the issue, as I've just mentioned, is that science cannot answer every question. There are loads of questions that science can't answer, and scientists would be the first to acknowledge that because they don't necessarily even see science as a route to absolute truth. The scientific method is not described as a way of completely accessing indefeasible knowledge. So modernism has a fundamental problem, which is that it leaves so much in doubt. And so postmodernism is variously described, but one one description of it is that it is a it, it is a re-emergence re of narrative, of storytelling, and that there are a lot of meta-narratives, big sort of overarching stories that link together all of these little stories that help us make sense of the world. So religion, for example, could be a meta-narrative. It could be a way for resolving all sorts of little questions through stories that help us reconcile ourselves to the world. So what's, what's significant about postmodernism is not the truth, but is, the, is how interesting the story is. If we are compelled to believe in the story, then truth doesn't particularly matter. Now, this is not to denigrate these stories. You know, it's not to say that that makes them illegitimate, because they work. They work at, at making people feel more safe. It, they work in making people feel like they have a purpose, where science cannot do that. So postmodernism would critique modernism. It would say, it would point out its problems. But just because it is founded to a significant extent on narrative and on story doesn't mean that it is somehow to be disdained or belittled because modernism doesn't have any better access to the truth than postmodernism. Okay, And so this is where we get lots of critiques of of different stories. So the, another sort of constant theme in postmodernism is that it's sort of poking fun sometimes, and it's quite self self referential. It's quite meta. So you get a lot uh, of postmodern styles of hero, which are kind of almost like the antithesis of other forms of hero. So Batman is an early example. The Dark Knight. He skulks around in the dark. He wears a disguise. He doesn't want people to know who he is. So he's not reveling in his, in his powers, he's using them discreetly and he's therefore sometimes described as an anti-hero and almost like the anti-Superman. And therefore he has the sort of hints of postmodernism about him because he's almost like the, the opposite narrative to the Superman narrative. He's sort of critiquing some of that optimism of Superman and trying to show that the world isn't so so positive and isn't worth saving necessarily, it's just worth you know, fighting for, if, if that makes sense. There are some other perhaps more obviously postmodern forms of superheroes, such as in, in Alan Moore's book, The Watchmen. In, in this book, Alan Moore, not, Alan Moore not only sort of critiques the superheroes, because the, the superheroes are not heroic, they're, they're vulgar and they are completely lacking in virtue, so they are totally anti-heroic. 
But as a consequence, Moore is, is kind of mocking his audience. So that it, it has a lot of sort of meta-analysis to it. It's, sort of, it. it's a comic book about comic books. <laughs> so it's, it's very postmodern in that sense. Uh, perhaps a more recent example is, well, definitely a more recent example, is The Boys as a, a TV show, where again you have heroes that are barbaric and, and vulgar and t totally lacking in virtue. And so the word hero is, is almost utterly inappropriate. And again, it's a sort of a staunch critique of a lot of what we assumed about superheroes. And it makes a, a, an ongoing commentary about the idea of what it means to be heroic. And as a consequence, it's sort of playing around with alternative narratives about the world. What is a hero? What is virtue? What is power? And it's tapping into a lot of these meta-narratives, which makes it, therefore, I would argue, a bit postmodern. Okay, so um, what about sort of contemporary heroism? Well, one of the themes that is important is, is gender in heroism. So we've seen recently big comic book companies like Marvel investing a lot in female heroes and trying to add a bit more diversity into their lineup of heroes, not only in, in regards to gender but also race and, and ethnicity and nationality. And so this raises a lot of interesting questions. So, I mean, I suppose, first of all, we could just start with a straightforward economic question. Is this driven by demand or supply? Is there a demand? Let's, let's take sort of female superheroes, something, something like Black Widow or She-Hulk. Is there a demand for that? Is that why the companies are making these things in order to satisfy demand? Or is this a supply side phenomenon? Is this that uh, supply will create its own demand and actually the demand is a bit mixed that maybe young women don't want those sorts of stories, but the companies feel they ought to produce them or they feel that if they do start producing them, then the demand will come. It's quite difficult to tell, but I suppose one thing that I'd be interested to know, and, and this is something I absolutely can't answer myself, so I'd love to hear your views in the comments, is whether or not men are perhaps more predisposed to the hero genre. That men, perhaps as a consequence of some sort of ideas of masculinity, feel like they need to be powerful and therefore find a particularly sort of compelling escape in a superhero story where young women may be a bit less interested in those sorts of ideas of extraordinary capability and extraordinary power that would allow you to dominate a scenario. As I say, I don't know the answer to that, so, but I'm interested to know your views. I suppose this is something that we couldn't resolve as individuals, we'd have to do surveys of the population. Um, but it's possible that the hero genre is somewhat associated with masculinity but maybe it doesn't need to be, and maybe there are sort of female her heroic archetypes that could be markedly different to the male ones. I mean, perhaps a bit of a problem for some of these big companies like Marvel is when they produce female superheroes that are sort of knock-off copies of the male archetypes. So She-Hulk, for example, appears to simply be a female version of the Hulk, which isn't a terribly interesting or rounded character. Now, Cards on the table, I haven't watched She-Hulk, so I really have no idea and I can't comment. But at least at sort of at first blush, it feels like it's just you've taken the Hulk and you've made the Hulk into a, a woman and, and that's your She-Hulk. It could be that what women want is a more sort of well-rounded, complex sort of interpretation of what it means to be a hero from a woman's perspective. But like I say, I do not have the answers to this, so do please let me know your thoughts. But more broadly, this gets us into the economics of the superhero genre. All of this stuff we've been talking about, the, the, the aesthetics of Superman wearing underpants over leggings, uh, the, the psychology of it, of being in a mythless age and seeking out fantasies of being super powerful, and the philosophy of it, of it all, makes it incredibly valuable. <laughs> right? There's enormous markets, as, as I'm sure you're aware. But that wasn't obvious at the start, so these, these men are Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster who came up with the artwork and the story of Superman back in the 1930s. And they sold the rights to the of the character to Action Comics for 130 bucks, uh, plus a promise for employment. They obviously had no clue that they had just created a billion dollar brand. I mean, at that, even just the 
uh, a mint condition copy of Action Comics number one was sold recently at auction for three and a quarter million dollars. So even just a, a perfectly pristine copy of that comic that they both produced was worth vastly more than they earned from selling the character. So that is so fascinating. They, they didn't realise that they had created something so powerful that was going to tap into the zeitgeist in such a major way. And it, it, it sort of brings a degree of shame upon some characters in this story because these men were, uh, were clearly underpaid for their contribution. Now, I suppose you could argue, well, they, they you know, sold the character and, and they lost all rights to it and, and it was all fair. But, you know, Action Comics and later Warner, Warner Media made such a huge amount of money from them that, they, that Warner sheepishly gave these men a pension in the 1970s because they were in poverty and they had not benefited nearly as much as these companies had from the sales of their character. So there's an interesting sort of question here about not only the psychology and, and philosophy of superheroes, but also the, the raw economics of it, and who owns the characters, and, and how they are marketed, and how they become so popular, and who benefits from, from them, both materially, but also psychologically. Materially in the sense of earning money, psychologically in the sense of um, feeling connected to the character, which I suppose is the whole audience. It's, it's you and me, potentially. Okay. But, you know, how connected can we feel to superheroes? Because there's still a sort of obvious sense to which people that are interested in comic books and superheroes are, are sort of ostracised. They are not accepted as part of the mainstream. Their behaviour is considered somewhat abnormal. And it's almost problematised that someone who is really into comic books can be sort of disdained as a bit of a nerd. You've got these three men here who are obviously at some sort of comic book convention. But if they left that hall and walked down the street, they would be considered very strange. I mean, if, if the three of them walked into, say, a supermarket, that would, I, I suspect, cause a bit of alarm because it's so unusual. But, you know, perhaps if people got over the alarm, then they would just sort of start, start to disdain the three men as as perhaps being a little bit immature, perhaps being a bit sad and nerdy. And again, my inner child, my inner toddler, which is sort of wondering why we judge them in that way. And perhaps we don't, perhaps you don't, perhaps this is me projecting to, to the world. But I do get a sense that there is uh, a, a sense in which it's not acceptable to be that into comic books. At least it's not sort of widely acceptable and that you need some sort of safe spaces and and communities that would be willing to accept you. And this is the other reason why I encourage people and students of mine to think more like children, because children don't come with prejudgments either. If they found out that someone was really interested in a particular character, they would just think, oh, okay, great. <laughs> there wouldn't be any particular sort of judgment about that. And I guess I still don't get it. I don't know why we would ostracize someone for wearing an outfit, even as an adult. What do we benefit from that sort of behaviour? Why, why would we do that? I, I don't get it. Um, but I think it says a lot about our inner psychology of, of being sort of slightly unnerved by the people that are different to us. But also, frankly, people that are very open and honest about their, their indulgence in, in, in a fantasy and their willingness to indulge in this fantasy of having superpowers. Because a lot of us do that. I mean, almost all of us, if, if, the, if the economics are to be believed. And yet those that do it more openly are considered to be strange to the point that they should be sort of bullied and, and vilified and ostracised and all, all the rest of it. So I think that's worth reflecting on. You know, it, it, it shouldn't be, I don't think. I don't think there's a moral case for us to treat people like that. But again, I'd be very interested to know your thoughts. You know, why, why do some people get really into superheroes? And why do many other people think that's a problem? Let me know in the comments. I'd love to know your thoughts. Anyway, so that brings us to the end of the lecture. And the aim was to talk about why Superman uh, wears underpants over leggings. And the basic answer is because he looked a bit like a bodybuilder 
of the early 19, 1900s. The bigger question is in, you know, why are we interested in superheroes as a species? Why is it such an enduring uh, trope in, in literature and media? And what are some of the deeper philosophical and psychological questions that it unearths? And this is the sort of analysis that will come to you if you behave in a more childish way. If you ask questions like, oh, what's going on there? Why is Superman dressed like that? And why is his hair parted one way but not the other? And, and why is he just wearing primary colours? And why this and why that? You know, it's so empowering to think more like a child. And that is exactly how I teach undergraduates at the University of Oxford. And I absolutely encourage you to do the same. But thanks for watching. If you have any comments or questions, do stick them in, in the uh, boxes below. And I look forward to seeing you at the next video. Thanks everyone. Bye now.